Nobody likes waiting rooms. Whether it's the office of a doctor or a dentist, a lawyer, or a hospital, most people have a similar distaste for waiting rooms. They all have those chairs that it is absolutely impossible to get comfortable in, right? They have a television mounted way up high, so you've got to strain your neck to see it. They got the volume so low you can't hear it, and it's a channel you don't care about anyway. Or you can read one of the magazines from 18 months ago that are lying there. I mean, pretty much, waiting rooms are very similar, aren't they? But even worse than the predictable surroundings of a waiting room is the actual waiting itself. Let's face it, nobody likes to wait. It's like the Christian that prayed, Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. It doesn't happen that way. In fact, I always tell people, beware if you're praying for patience. Because patience only comes one way. And that's by dealing with problems. So when you pray for patience, you're actually praying for problems. Uh, might want to hold off on that one. But oftentimes we find ourselves in a waiting room. Rick Yon has written a, a really good book called God's Waiting Room. And he defines it this way. God's waiting room is a state which is involuntary, helpless to determine the outcome. Highly stressful, perplexing, a place of realizing personal inadequacy, and a place where God will gradually unfold the next chapter of life. Waiting rooms like this have a lot of different appearances. It might be a hospital room. It might be being stuck at home. It might be a prison cell. There are a lot of different ways in which God's waiting room manifests itself. But it's something that we probably all experience at one time or another. It's a situation that we don't particularly want to be in ourselves. We can't do anything about it. We may or may not have put ourselves there to begin with. We find out that we're not as in charge of things as we thought we were or would like to be. And it's a place where we must wait for God to unfold the next chapter of our lives. Several characters in the pages of Scripture found themselves in God's waiting room. Consider Moses, who spent 40 years in the land of Midian before God called him to go and liberate the Israelites from Egypt. David was anointed king over Israel, but he had to wait 10 years before he ascended the throne. Job waited an undisclosed time in misery before his situation was rectified. Paul spent years in the Arabian desert before he was called into ministry. And we read about these things in a few verses, and we pass over them. We don't really think about it. But can you imagine all that time that passed? Ten years? Forty years? I'm sure for Job, we're not told how long that took, but it probably seemed like eternity, right? Because of the affliction that he had suffered. Now sometimes those who are in God's waiting room put themselves there. Moses is an example of that. The reason why Moses was in Midian is because he killed an Egyptian and had to run for his life. And sometimes we put ourselves in situations like that. Jonah would be another. The reason why Jonah ended up in the belly of a whale was his own choices. I would say those are situations that are a little easier to deal with. There's a sense of fairness, a sense of justice about it. I've done wrong, I'm paying for it, I'll move on. But there are other times where we find ourselves in a state of affliction that wasn't our own fault. How many of you remember being in grade school and the teacher's writing on the chalkboard and kids are messing around behind her back and she turns around and says, okay, who did that? No one's going to say me, right? It's silence. And, and so she says, all right, the whole class is going to be punished. I see teachers that are going, mm-hmm, yep, I know all about that. 
You think, that's not fair. Why should everybody get punished for what a few people do? Welcome to life. Life isn't always fair. God isn't always fair. Let's be real about it. He's just. There's a big difference between his justice and our idea of fairness. The scripture that was read earlier from Lamentations, it's a little bit of background about that book. Jeremiah the prophet wrote that book after the city of Jerusalem. His city was destroyed. He's walking through the rubble, pouring his heart out in all of the misery that he sees and is experiencing himself. What did Jeremiah do to deserve that treatment? Nothing. He was faithful, but his people were not. And he suffered along with his people. And we do find that sometimes our times of affliction come not because of our choices and actions, but the choices and actions of others. And I would suggest another person that fit this category was Caleb. In our last message, we saw how Caleb courageously took a stand against the antagonism of his fellow Israelites. They had gone along with ten others to spy out the land of Canaan. They came back with great report of the fruitfulness of the land, I mean, they brought one cluster of grapes that two guys had to carry on a pole, showing just how, how fruitful this land is. But ten of them said, we can't do it. There's giants there. There's fortified cities. They outnumber us. We can't do it. And Caleb said, no, but God can. We should go. But the majority won out. And we see that that rebellion, that stubbornness had terrible consequences. Here they are at the border of the land of Canaan, ready to take it, ready for God to hand it to them, and God says, turn around and set out toward the desert. Go back toward the Red Sea. Go back to where you were. You're not going in. You say, you can't do it, and I'm saying you won't do it. Not going to happen. You go out into the wilderness until the whole generation of you dies. You know who got caught up in that? Caleb and Joshua. Now, God wasn't upset with them. In fact, if you turn to Numbers chapter 32, you find exactly what God thinks of Caleb and Joshua. Numbers 32 verses 11 and 12 God is speaking here, because they have not followed me wholeheartedly, not one of the men 20 years old or more who came up out of Egypt will see the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not one except Caleb, son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, and Joshua, son of Nun, for they followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Note that word, wholeheartedly. It's a key to understanding how Caleb was able to maintain a courageous stand in spite of the affliction that he was suffering. They served the Lord wholeheartedly. But despite that, they had to be in God's waiting room with all the other Israelites. David Jeremiah describes what that must have been like for Caleb. All his contemporaries were dying you might remember that a condition for entering the promised land was that all that unfaithful generation, the one that shied away from the giants, had to die before God would permit the crossing of the Jordan. It took 38 years in the wilderness for that to happen. Caleb grew older as he waded through the decades, checking the obituaries every day and seeing the last of his old friends die. A generation of funerals would make the best of us gloomy and morose, but not Caleb. The fire in the furnace of his soul was still lit. He was still living wide open for God. How can you do that? How can you go through such an unfair, miserable situation, not of your own doing, 
and still maintain that attitude, that courage? Well, I go back to that word that God used of Joshua and Caleb in Numbers 32, wholeheartedly. They followed God wholeheartedly. And as we understand that term and how it is lived out, we're going to see how Caleb maintained his courage in spite of affliction. The first aspect of Caleb's courage is his focus. In order to survive those difficult days in God's waiting room, we have to maintain our focus. Or to use a modern phrase, keep your eye on the ball. Any of you that ever played baseball or softball, Know the importance of keeping your eye on the ball, not only when you're at bat, but also when you're in the field. We saw an example of this at the Super Bowl last week, where at a critical time of the game, the quarterback throws a pass, and I mean, it was on the, right on the money. I mean, it was a perfect pass, right in his hands, but you could see the receiver had already turned his head upfield, and he dropped the ball. You got to keep your eyes on the ball. You've got to keep your focus. There are a lot of things that can distract our attention from God and His will, so it takes effort to do that. There's a verse in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. In the King James Version, it reads like this For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show Himself strong in the behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward Him. Now, a lot of us hear that word perfect and say, well, that ain't me. (laughs) This verse doesn't apply to me because I'm not perfect. In fact, I don't know anybody who is. Well, the word here does not mean sinless perfection that God has. God is perfect in that way. We certainly aren't. In fact, the word here isn't the normal word translated perfect that means sincere. It's actually a Hebrew word that means whole, complete, A whole heart is in contrast with a divided heart. James talks about a double-minded man who's unstable in all his ways. Jesus says no one can serve two masters. You're going to love one and hate the other, follow one or not the other. You can't serve two at once. That's the idea here. An undivided focus, undivided attention and loyalty. And Caleb was one who wholeheartedly, wholly followed the Lord. Remember when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And he said, you will love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Not just part of it. Not just one day a week or one hour a week. All your heart wholeheartedly means to not take our eyes off of him. We see a very graphic example of this in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 14. It's a story I'm sure you've heard before. You may be very familiar with it. Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse 25. After Jesus had fed 5,000 on the mountainside, he told the disciples, get in the boat, go across the lake, I'll catch up with you. Well, as they're out in the lake in the middle of the night, a storm comes up. And at least half of these 12 guys were professional fishermen. You'd think they'd have you know, been through this before. So it must have been a pretty bad storm because they were scared to death. Verse 25, during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter said, tell me to come out to you on the water. Now, Use a little sanctified imagination here, okay? Pretend you're one of the other 11, right? You know, ship's going back and forth, and you're wondering if, you know, it's going to tip over or what's going to happen. Here's Jesus walking on the water. Wow, you know? And then he says, it's me. You know, I'm not a ghost. Don't be afraid. And then Peter spouts off, oh, Lord, let me come out there. And you're like, whatever, 
I'm sure 22 eyes rolled in the back of their heads when Peter said, let me come out there. Andrew's probably saying, yeah, go ahead and do it. <laughs> you know, Peter got out there, and he started walking on water. You know, we all know Jesus did it. Well, he's the son of God. Okay, sure, but here's Simon Peter walking on top of the water, walking toward Jesus. Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me! Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Peter was doing fine as long as he was watching Jesus. As long as he had his eyes on the Lord... He was doing the impossible. He was defying the laws of nature. But when he took his eyes off of Jesus, when he started to look around and, and the waves and the wind and the storm, and he's saying, what am I doing out here? Blah, 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 right? Starts to sink. And Jesus reached out and grabbed him. Peter. Why did you doubt? Because he took his eyes off of the Lord. And that often happens. Doubts come when we put a wrong focus on the circumstances. When we're looking at what's going on around us, it's easy to be discouraged. It's easy to be afraid. Throw our hands up and say, what can we do? What's going to happen? But when we have our eyes on Jesus, it's a whole different story. And what we need is a God focus on life. We need to see life the way Jacob, or Jacob, Joshua and Caleb saw the promised land. They saw the giants, they saw the fortified cities, they saw the obstacles, as well as the fruitfulness of the land. But the one thing they saw that the other guys didn't was they saw God. And that was where their focus was. The other guys focused on the giants. And Caleb said, the Lord can do this, and we should go and do it. Where is our focus? Are we focusing on what's going on around us, or are we focusing on God? I think of the time in uh, the wilderness where God had sent poisonous snakes into the camp. I can't even say those words without getting goosebumps because I don't like snakes. And as the snakes bit the Israelites, they would die. But God said to Moses, make a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, hold it up, and if the Israelites will look at the, sir, the bronze snake, then the other snakes won't harm them. You know what you had to do in order to look at the bronze snake? You had to stop looking at the ground. You couldn't be looking to see which snake was going to bite you. You couldn't try to get away. You're focusing on the bronze serpent, which was what God had said and which was a prefigurement of Christ being lifted up on the cross. Faith is focusing on God and not focusing on the circumstances. I'm not saying we shouldn't be aware of them. I'm saying don't put your focus there. Because when we do, we will lose our courage. Guaranteed. It takes that kind of faith. The author of Hebrews encourages this in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Passage like this makes me think Paul was a sports fan. He uses a lot of athletic illustrations in his writings. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, I'm sure he's imagining the, the great uh, amphitheaters, the stadiums, filled with fans, watching the athletes. Let us throw off everything that hinders 
and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now notice verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Lose your courage. Don't lose your faith. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Another passage is Philippians 3, where Paul is speaking about himself. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have been already made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining for what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Once again, it's the idea of a race. He's running a race. And he says, I'm not worried about what's happening behind me. I'm pressing forward. I'm focusing on that finish line. You've probably all seen it if you haven't done it yourself. Where a person is out front in a race. And they kind of look over their shoulder to see where the competition is. And they lose a step or maybe even trip and fall. Forget about them. You just focus on what's ahead. Keep your focus. That was something Caleb was able to do. And he was able to endure the affliction of 40 years in the wilderness with the Israelites. The second component of Caleb's courage in, the, in spite of affliction is his faith. Now we've seen this evidenced. You know, he took a courageous stand against the other ten spies and ultimately against the entire Israelite people. We've got to be careful that we don't lose our faith in times of affliction. You know, some of us are so problem-oriented that all we see are the obstacles. All we see are the negatives. All we see are the problems. Everything looks like doom and gloom. We sometimes center our attention on everything that's wrong. We don't even see anything that is right. You know, God is a realist. God sees the problems. He knows the problems are there, but he has a plan. And the plan is to bring us through. And he wants us to gain that kind of perspective. Yes, problems are real. Life is painful. And sometimes we don't directly deserve it. But God can use even the painful experiences to shape us, to mold us, to make us more like his son, to prepare us for what he has down the road. With God, nothing is impossible. We need to remember that. Even in light of the most daunting of circumstances, God can do all things. And we need to put our faith there. From what we know of Caleb, he maintained a positive perspective throughout his life. I don't know that I could have done that. I'll be honest. I don't know if it would have been year three or year 33 or somewhere in the midst of you know, taking laps around the Sinai Peninsula. I'd have been so tempted to find those ten other spies and kick them in the shins and say, nice going, guys. You're the reason we're out here. If it weren't for you, I'd be sipping tea on the mountain of Hebron in the Promised Land. Way to go. But we don't get any of that. You don't, you don't get any sense of that with Caleb. His faith in the Lord was firm. And that was allowed him to maintain a positive attitude. Joshua 14 is kind of the end of the story. We're going to focus our attention there in our next message. But in Joshua 14, we see Caleb recounting how God had brought him through the wilderness to the brink of fulfillment. Caleb was given two promises, actually. One was longevity of life, and the other that he would someday inherit the territory that he had explored. And it was a tough part of the land. 
We're going to look at that next Sunday. But 45 years had passed since he had gotten the promise and now it's about to be fulfilled. That is an awful long time to be in God's waiting room. But he focused on the promises of God and that sustained him through the difficulties. He knew the promises were sure even though they might take a long time to come. He never allowed those afflictions to dim his faith in the Lord. One person put it this way, never doubt in the dark what God has revealed in the light. The things that we learn throughout our lives, through God's Word, through His Spirit, they may not mean much at the time we learn them, but when we get into the difficulties, boy, they are a lifesaver. Hold on to your faith. Remember the definition of faith in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is being sure of what we hope for. And as Paul explained in Romans, we don't hope for something we've already got. <laughs> hope is something future. In fact, I call hope future faith. You know, Faith is trusting in what God has done. Hope is trusting in what God will do. And we trust that God's going to do it. It's a certainty of things we do not see. We may not see the end result, but we can rest assured that we will receive what God has promised. That's what faith is all about. And then finally, Caleb's courage demanded fidelity. Caleb stayed true to God throughout the long years of wandering. So regardless of the circumstances, Caleb remained faithful. You go back to that phrase God used. He follows me wholeheartedly. He said that in Numbers 14.24. Repeated it again in chapter 32. He has a different spirit. He follows me wholeheartedly. I will bring him into the land. His descendants will inherit it. Literally, that means that he filled himself completely with the Lord. There's nothing held back. No reservations. He was faithful to the Lord. Paul demonstrates the same kind of fidelity. In Romans 1.9, he says, God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of His Son. And we know Paul was all in when it came to serving Christ. This isn't just an added extra for the super saints, though, as if there were such a thing. Paul later writes to the Romans, Thanks be to God, though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. Wholeheartedly accepted God's word and acted on it. He writes to the Ephesian Christians in Ephesians 6-7, Serve wholeheartedly as if you're serving the Lord and not men. In Hebrews 6, 11, and 12, we want each of you to sow the same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. We don't want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what's been promised. I don't know if he was thinking about Caleb and Joshua right there, but he could have been. Because through faith and patience, they eventually inherited the promise. Warren Wearsby writes about these verses, this progress demands diligent effort. While it's true that it is God who carries us along to maturity, it's also true that the believer must do his part. We must not be lazy, but apply ourselves to the spiritual resources God has given us. We have the promises of God. We should exercise faith and patience and claim these promises for ourselves. Like Caleb and Joshua, we must believe God's promise and want to go in and claim the land. Our faith requires faithfulness to last through these days in God's waiting room. In fact, the Hebrew language doesn't distinguish between faith and faithfulness. They're interchangeable. Because to have faith means you are faithful. You remain true. And that was certainly true of Caleb. And it needs to be true of us. Paul writes in Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. 
And that's a big if. Because the temptation is to give up. The temptation is to walk away and say, I can't do this. If we do not give up, we will receive a harvest. It may not take 45 years. I, for one, hope it doesn't. But whatever it is, God will bring us through. It may not even be in this lifetime. God has made us promises for eternal life beyond this life. For those who are faithful to Him, who hold on to the promises in spite of the affliction we may experience, in spite of the circumstances, even when the the circumstances aren't our fault, even when we aren't the ones responsible for being in that waiting room, wait on God. Like Joseph, he was put in one waiting room after another (laughs) until the time was right and God put him exactly where he needed to be. And God will do the same for us if we will keep our focus on Him, keep our faith in Him, and be faithful to Him.